Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and in this video, we're going to be discussing best practices for assessing and treating QL syndrome. QL syndrome sounds a lot more complicated and a lot more serious than it actually is. Realistically, this is just a fancy phrase for a tight and painful QL muscle. QL meaning quadratus lumborum. And we can see the left and right quadratus lumborum there on the posterior view of the low back. Now, before we get into specific treatments for this condition, realistically, just to loosen up this muscle, uh, we need to have an understanding of the anatomy so we know where the muscle is and we know how to accurately diagnose it. So first of all, the origins of this muscle are more on the inferior side. So it originates off of the superior aspect of the posterior iliac crest and also a little bit off of the iliolumbar ligament. Now the fibers, generally speaking, run vertically from that and they insert on the inferior border of the 12th rib, which is one of the floating ribs, and then also on the transverse processes of L1 through L4. Now the actions of the QL depend on whether both are contracting at the same time or the contractions are unilateral. So for bilateral contractions, there's two main actions. One, the most common one we think of is lumbar extension. Now by no means are the QLs the prime movers of lumbar extension. The spinal erectors are the prime movers of lumbar extension, but the QLs will act synergistically with those. And also, they will stabilize the 12th rib during forced inhalation or inspiration. So when you're hyperventilating, like during an anxiety attack or a panic attack, or during exercise, whether it's resistance training or aerobic exercise, the higher intensity you get, the more inhalation has to be forced, active. The QLs will be active during that as well. Now, when the QLs contract unilaterally, they're going to facilitate ipsilateral lumbar side bending or lateral flexion and also ipsilateral hip hike. Now, when we get to strengthening, yes, the QLs facilitate hip hike, but I would say that is a very, very poor way to strengthen the QL. The much better way is to perform lumbar lateral flexion and to progressively overload that, but we'll get there towards the end of the video. Now, in order to accurately diagnose somebody as having a tight QL or QL syndrome, we have to know where the QL is, and this is where palpation skill is going to come in handy. We're going to take a look at this surface anatomy picture there at the bottom of the screen. Very helpful. That vertical white line, that is the midline. That's where the spine is. So of course the muscle is going to be lateral to that. Now before we start feeling around for muscles, I actually think it's more helpful to find the superior and inferior boundaries of the QL. The superior boundary is going to be the insertion, which is the 12th rib. Okay, so you kind of just follow down and kind of find the lowest rib. That's your superior boundary. If you're above that, that's not the QL, okay? Then the inferior boundary is the brim of the iliac crest there. So if you find the brim of the iliac crest, that's the inferior boundary. If you're below that, that's not QL. It's gotta be between the 12th rib and the iliac crest. Now the question is, where is it? exactly laterally from the spine. So if you find the midline and go directly lateral to that, you'll kind of find the bulge of the spinal erectors, assuming they're not atrophied too much in the individual. But usually to some extent, people are gonna have a little bulge there. That is going to be the spinal erectors. Those are gonna be more superficial. And it is true, some of the spinal erectors might be partially covering up the medial parts of the QL, but pretty much as soon as you sink off of that erector spiny ridge, that's going to be the start of the QL, at least the QL that you can directly get by pushing into the soft tissue, okay? Yes, there's a little bit of the QL covered by the spinal erectors, but for the most part, the vast majority of the muscle is just lateral to that spinal erector ridge. And once you're in that vicinity, you are in the QL zone. Now that's fine and dandy and all, we know where their QL is, but it's not just one point in space. We wanna make sure that of the QL, we're on the right spot. So this is where we're communicating with the patient. We put a finger on that spot, maybe dig in a little bit and say, hey, is this exactly where your pain is? Maybe they'll say yes, maybe they'll guide us, maybe up, in, out, down, whatever it is. We wanna make sure we're right on that particular spot for the patient because when we do the manual and eventually self-releases, we wanna make sure that we're targeting the site to a high degree of precision, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Now, before we get into the specific uh, treatment approach for QL syndrome, we need to understand why is it tight in the first place? And I would say 99 out of 100 times, it's because it's compensating for weakness elsewhere. And to really understand this, we need to look at the actions of the QL and try to think about what other larger muscles share in those actions. 
right? Because if the prime mover for a particular movement is very weak, that's gonna make it more likely that the QL will tighten up to compensate. Compensatory tightness due to a weak gluteus medius. Anytime you suspect QL syndrome, I would take a gluteus medius manual muscle test, preferably with a handheld dynamometer to get exact pounds of force. But in any case, if you suspect that the gluteus medius is weak on one or both sides, that's going to potentially compromise frontal plane stability of the pelvis. And one way the body can try to counteract that is to tighten up at the QL. Again, if you think about the placement of this muscle, its actions, it could, to a small extent, give you a little bit of frontal plane stability, but it's not ideal. The gluteus medius is definitely needed for that. And so in that case, you would want to strengthen up those muscles. Weak spinal erectors. Well, if the spinal erectors are weak, then a lumbar extension is going to be weak, and, and particularly guarding against excessive lumbar flexion with particular movements like lifting things from the ground. So if the spinal erectors are weak, well, then the QLs could also be tight. And then compensatory tightness due to a weak core. And yes, the spinal erectors are technically part of the core, but for this, I'm really thinking about the anterolateral core muscles, in particular, the obliques. So the internal and external obliques facilitate lumbar side bending. So again, frontal plane stability of the spine. And if those muscles are weak, well then the QL may tighten up to compensate. So if we're gonna address QL syndrome properly and stave it off long-term, we're gonna to need to make sure that if there's any weakness in those muscles, that we address those weaknesses and strengthen up. But first, we may not be able to do much of that if the pain severity and irritability are really high. So phase one of QL syndrome treatment is pain management. And what are some ways we can do that? Well, probably the best way is to release the QL. And this is where, again, knowing where it is is very important and also communicating with the patient that we're on the right spot. So to perform a manual QL release, we first need to make sure that we're in the zone of the QL. If we're way up here or down in the buttock, that's not the QL. And we might need to take a different approach. So recall from earlier in the video that the, the QL is bounded superiorly by the 12th rib. There's our 12th rib medially by the spinal erector bulge, and then inferiorly by the iliac crest. And if the pain is located within that zone, we're likely dealing with a tight and painful QL. So I could take out a massage gun, I could always do that. I could just do some soft tissue work on it, but what tends to work really well is a QL release. So I'm just gonna take my elbow, put it right in that spot. Now. I don't want this to be excruciatingly painful, okay? Um, I do want to be able to use a good amount of force. However, if the patient tells me that it's too much, we're gonna back off a little bit and find that maximum tolerable zone of force. So I'm going to dig in a little bit here. I'm gonna ask the patient, is that force okay? Yeah. Good. Over the course of this release, I might ask her if I can go a little bit deeper into it. But again, I want to make sure that we're always in a, an amount of force that is tolerable. And as I talked about before, we're going to hold this a minimum of 90 seconds, preferably 90 seconds, so a minute and a half to two minutes. Any longer than that, you get diminishing returns. But we want to get to that 90 second mark because effectively what we're doing here is we are starving the muscle of oxygen. We're cutting off the blood supply through those capillaries. And so we're making it to where the muscle can no longer run on oxidative phosphorylation. There's that biochemistry coming back to bite you. And so we're forcing the muscle to switch to anaerobic metabolism. And so after that 90 second mark, that muscle's just like, whoa, okay, I'll stop. And it relaxes. And after we do that manual release, we can of course have the patient sit up, stand up, take a test spin, walk around, see if it feels better, and then go into some of the self-releases, which we're about to talk about. Those of you who watch these videos know that I'm a big fan of, if we do a manual technique, reinforce it with an exercise the patient can do at home. And a great way to do this is a QL self-release with a tennis ball, which I'm gonna explain right now. All right, now I'm gonna show you a self-release for the quadratus lumborum. And all you're gonna need is a ball, like a tennis ball. This is a lacrosse ball, a little bit harder. Baseball might work, but for some people it might be a little bit, whoops, a little bit too rough on that muscle, particularly if it's quite severe. So essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna put that ball right under the QL that is painful. 
and we want to get it right on the tightest spot there. Now, under the assumption that all the following positions are tolerated by the person, the completely supine position is the easiest position on the QL. It's going to put the least pressure from the ball into the QL. And that's because in this position, I have the most lumbar lordosis, the most relative lumbar extension. What I can do, though, is I can switch to the supine hook line position. What is wrong with you? Maybe she has a tight QL also. This position is going to put a little bit more pressure onto the QL and into the tennis ball because now by bending the knees, I've removed some of that lumbar lordosis and relative to the totally flat supine position, I've got just a little bit less extension, a little more flexion. Now, you could certainly just lay here, but what I really like to do is on the side where the ball is, in this case, my left facing the camera, I'm gonna take this knee and I can hold it behind the thigh or on top of the knee, and this adds even more pressure. So if this is too much, then scale it back to simple supine hook line. But for those individuals that can really tolerate a lot and where it's maybe a little bit less severe, a little bit less irritable, I like to do a dynamic single knee to chest like this. So I'm not bringing the leg all the way down, but I'm essentially just rubbing the QL, so to speak, or grinding it over that ball. And this is essentially the release. What I could also do to make this even more intense, I can drop this leg down, and this is the most intense version of all of these. Now, just like with the manual QL release, I wanna make sure that I'm holding this at least a minute and a half, maybe a minute and a half to two minutes. Any longer than that, you're kind of going to get a diminishing returns, but somewhere in that 90 to 120 second range is optimum for the same reasons we talked about for the manual release. And then once I've finished with this release, I will go ahead and sit up and then stand up, walk around and give it a little test spin and see if that pain in that area is lessened. If it is, once again, we know we are on the right track. Another exercise that I found really helpful for just getting the QL to relax even more is by doing seated Swiss ball rollouts. And I don't just have them roll out in the forward direction. I will do that, but we'll also go off a little bit to their left, in the middle, out to the right, and then just kind of go back and forth. And this is really effective after you do some type of release, whether it's just the manual or with the tennis ball. Okay. Now, once we've gotten the patient's pain, severity, and irritability quite a bit down, we're going to enter phase two where we start eliminating the compensation by strengthening up whatever it is that we need to strengthen that is weak and causing the QL to become tight as a compensation. And sometimes this phase can be on the same day as phase one. There, you may encounter patients where you do the release and it is like instantaneous relief. They feel like a new person. Well, if that's all you do, it may not stick. We need to strengthen up the weak points. So for example, if it's gluteus medius weakness, we can do sideline hip abductions, we can do banded hip thrusts, lunges, split squats, any exercise that to any extent targets the gluteus medius. But of course, whatever exercise we're doing, we have to meet the patient where they're at. Not every patient's gonna be able to straight up do uh, Bulgarian split squats, right? Some patients may have to be on the table and do some sideline hip abductions or whatever it is, right? Meet them where they're at. If we have weak spinal erectors, we can do dowel hip hinges, right? To start working on activation of those muscles. Uh, it might be RDLs or good mornings, depending on the level of the patient, right? If it's weak core, we want to make sure that we're addressing core weaknesses in all three of the major planes. So for sagittal plane, maybe it's some type of reverse sit-up type of exercise. Okay, and there's different ways to scale that down, not just this level of intensity there. If we're in the coronal plane, maybe it's a weighted side bend. We could always start with an isometric version of this, like a farmer carry or a suitcase carry. But eventually, we want to be doing dynamic strengthening. And then also transverse plane. Maybe we start with some Pavlov press, right? Um, sometimes uh, strengthening in the coronal plane is a little bit too much for people at first because that's one of the actions of the QL. But we can get the oblique stronger without doing side bending. We can do rotation. So again, resisting rotation with a simple Pavlov press, or as you can see right here, our resisted lumbar rotations, whether it's with a band, sorry about that, 
or a cable machine. But we just start strengthening up these muscles. And as we get these muscles stronger, assuming we got our diagnosis correct, that QL should start loosening up. And then phase three, which is really a continuation of phase two, where we just keep progressively overloading on the strengthening and even getting into some more advanced strengthening exercises, where yes, we're strengthening the prime movers, like the spinal erectors, the obliques, but these are also strengthening the QL and making it more resilient, also less likely that it will tighten up in the future. So we want to be focusing on progressing our lumbar side bending and extension exercises with maybe a little more of an emphasis on side bending. So again, your standing weighted side bends with a kettlebell or a dumbbell. This is my favorite way to do this type of exercise. I don't particularly like doing it on a Smith machine, although you could do that. You've got your Roman chair side bends. Absolutely phenomenal exercise for targeting uh, the obliques and also the QL. In fact, some people, I don't really agree with this, even call these side bends on the QL uh, QL side bends. I don't know why they do that. It does target the QL, but it's just that the obliques are the prime mover there. But again, great exercise. And then your Roman chair back extensions. And again, you can start those isometrically in terms of the back, but again, you can start allowing the back to flex and extend as you go back up and start working these muscles, not only the spinal erectors, but the QL muscles uh, concentrically and eccentrically there, okay? So again, when you're treating QL syndrome, you have to first accurately diagnose it, but get rid of the pain first, or at least dramatically reduce it. Don't just jump into strengthening exercises. The patient may not like you very much. Drop that pain down and you will build so much rapport with your patient, they will love you and then start strengthening up the weak points and eventually building that QL resiliency. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding about how to diagnose and assess for QL syndrome and how to treat it. Please make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that notification button for notifications for all videos in the future. Thank you so much.